audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Neuroscience tells us our brains are wired to take the shortest path towards pleasure. Mm -hmm. We want to feel good now. And so it is easier for me to just keep doing something that isn't particularly helpful to me than take that huge step to making positive change. Conflict is inevitable in all relationships, but it's how we process those conflicts will help make your relationship stronger. But unfortunately, many people don't do the hard work or one person does more work and the other, well, let's face it, they're not doing the hard yards that it takes to make a relationship work. Our guest today is Joanne Wilson. and She's a counsellor and neuropsychotherapist. And Joanne will be providing an overview of some of the common relationship mistakes that she has seen in her practice over the last few years and some of the solutions. That's Joanne Wilson with my wife, Kate, and myself, Brett Ryan, for Focus on the Family. Australia. And welcome once again. Thanks for having me, Brett and Kate. And a special thanks to our friends at Salt FM on the Sunshine Coast for recording Joanne's side of the chat. We often refer to relationships of, you know, conflict and, you know, it's the tension. How do we do that well? But we all come from different backgrounds. And we mentioned in our first conversation about family of origin, but I think we need to do a little bit more digging in that area because sometimes we can always say, well, that's just the way I am. That's the way I was brought up. And then, Mm. you know, you put up with it and it's not fair for the other person and it's not fair for that person because you're not going to thrive in your relationship. You're just going to survive and that's not what we want. So going a little bit deeper, that family of origin, uh, Kate was mentioning just before in the pre-interview chat. Um, Kate, what were you referring to? I was referring to... The idea of if we are not proactive in dealing with the pain of the past, our spouse can never win really because everything they say or do gets run through what I suppose we could say is a damaged filter. Or distorted. Or distorted filter just because of what they've experienced. And so it's a bit of a guessing game of how somebody's going to receive something. Mm, I love that analogy, a distorted filter, and often they don't realise it. And I I think it's worth clarifying that sometimes it's not always your family of origin. It just could be that you've made some huge mistakes in your past, you know, after you left home or, or whatever. So it's just that element of the past. So our parents might not have behaved or nurtured us in a way that was optimum, that made us feel loved, respected, and connected. So that does have us ill-equipped. So you turn up in your relationship and you might be very reactive um, and that you intimated there, Kate, that yes, if you could deliver some feedback or you disagree with your partner and then they blow up and you're shocked by that Mm. response and you're like, where does that come from? So it's definitely worth that intention. Um, I know, Brett, you said couples are, you know, are they doing the hard work? Oh, it sounds so dreadful going into a marriage if it sounds like hard work. I don't like well, people think it's so it should be, If you're in love, it should be everything's easy, yeah. but it's not necessarily <laughs> it's the not. case. Yeah. So I think that daily intention is probably where I come from and nurturing it and setting up those rituals in your relationship that are a beautiful foundation that help you stay connected. But yes, I think it's worth just paying attention that if you are very reactive versus responsive, or if you're noticing that in your partner, you know, it sounds a bit weird, but this could be your beacon, your gift for positive change. So if you're expressing emotions in a certain way that uh, isn't particularly favorable, God gave Mm. us emotions and anger isn't necessarily a bad thing if it is channeled and used in the right way. So it would be dreadful if we didn't have painful emotions because we wouldn't be able to draw attention to the sickness in our body, but as well, those elements of our dynamic in the relationship that could yeah. do with improvement. And look, sometimes if we don't deal with it, some of the symptoms can be addictions. So if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be fantastic. 
Yeah, I think this is Joe based, not uh, clinical research based, but where I've um, over the last 15 years, it seems fairly consistent that when there is some form of addiction, there is a broken link somewhere with the connection with someone's past or Mm. just that sense of uh, that lack of connection with people in their family or absolute loneliness turning up in the counseling room. And so we try and fill that disconnection with with an addiction of all the different forms it uh i guess and the most common one is alcohol and i think it's you know it's young 30 year old successful women with you know one or two children that could be possibly drinking a bottle of or two or one a night or um, is that stressed Mm. out plumber who's running his own business that is trying to hold it all together that might be ducking off to a place of ill repute to cater for his uh, sex addiction. And so that is definitely too common that I noticed that people are just trying to relieve their stress or the pressure from the past um, Mm. by filling it with something that is an immediate fix. It it makes sense why people do it, but it's not the best way. It's not the way. No. no. And we have to be aware that addiction is a very complicated issue because many people who have never experienced any form of habitual nature of anything they're looking at it and saying, how could you do that? Because it's destroying you and it's destroying your family and it's destroying your relationship. Why don't you just stop? Mm. But it's not as yeah. simple as that. It's not. It's not. And so I think it's trying to have that courage to speak to somebody and work out the why. Can you see any disconnection there? Are you lonely? What is it? Is it disappointment, unforgiveness with yourself? As you said, it can be very complex. It could be all of those things. And so yeah. try to discover the why. Where is your hurt coming from? So uh, I think as well, then look at your triggers. What triggers me could be different to you, Kate. Uh, What Mm -hmm. uh, upsets me, what are my needs uh, can be completely different to another person. So I think it's just really worth looking at um, if it's a drinking habit, do you always drive past a bottle shop? If it's, um, you know, what are those aspects of your life that Mm. you can change to try and avoid falling into the trap. Who is your support people? And these days there's so many amazing podcasts. There is help out there. So it's just about, you know, putting your hand up and signaling uh, with that white flag. I surrender to this. I know that it's not good for me and my family or myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good point that is actually up to the individual to have that aha light bulb moment but yeah. if uh, there's someone, a spouse is listening to this right now and saying, well, that's my husband or that's my wife, mm. what would you advise them going through this? Yeah. Often, often uh, trying to take advice from your spouse is <laughs> the last person that you want to take advice from. So I absolutely mm. understand how, you know, you've got that nagging wife or husband who thinks they know more than you do. Um, sometimes if that isn't working, if you've gently tried to highlight that they are drinking too much or that you have a gut feeling that maybe they're stepping outside of the relationship and you've tried to approach it, but it's not going anywhere, sometimes you might need some support from other people, um, mm. some people that love them. And often in counselling, I say, who are the people that love you? I love to get the perspective of others, what do they think about this? And so yeah. you don't have to do it alone. So it could be a pastor or, but just don't leave it. It's not worth just going, you know, that term, that's just who he is. Just don't yeah. define them um, because that is a life that you don't deserve. Neither of you nor your partner, this doesn't belong to you. You can kind of externalize that behavior. We love the person, but not their behavior. Yeah. yeah. And I love that you say, bring alongside people who love you. Because mm. often when they're in the middle of something, they'll go to people who agree are, with them. <laughs> well, agree with them, or they are there to discourage you to hang on, or they're not helpful. They'll gossip, they'll tear down that spouse. It, and so instead of turning it into a pity party, taking mm. it to somebody who does love you and wants the best for you. And so Mm. we'll speak love and truth into a situation. And I know that my clients will say that perfect person, they will avoid going to them because they love them and they will speak the truth to them. And sometimes that can take a bit of time just to be able to encourage them to go and get that accountability partner who is wise, who does want the best for them, but they'll do whatever it takes to avoid them because they're looking for that quick 
fix in the meantime. And our brains are wired towards pleasure and away from pain. And at that mm-hmm. moment, it is a shorter path to go for that quick fix in whatever that addiction is. And so it's the long game having to do it the hard way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's so good to point out. You know, often people know they're doing the wrong thing, you Mm. know, but they keep doing it. Talk about that from, you know, a brain perspective, because often we go, well, they made the decision to do it and then they just keep doing it, even though they know it's wrong. Yeah, neuroscience tells us we sit in the comfort of our discomfort. Again, that shorter path, Our brains are wired to take the shortest path towards pleasure. Mm -hmm. Uh, We want to feel good now. And so Mm -hmm. it is easier for me to just keep doing something that isn't particularly helpful to me than take that huge step to making positive change. And again, it can just be that small step in the positive direction, but it takes a lot of courage. And so if you've done that, I applaud you. And Mm. I know so many people have taken that small step away from that quick fix and seen the benefits. But I truly believe people when they say, I can't even believe that was me. It could even be an addiction to toxic thinking, not just, you know, alcohol or whatever that comes in so many different forms, but they're almost like, I cannot believe I didn't realize the consequences. I did not consider the consequences. And that's obviously a big response when I'm working with people in the field of infidelity. It's like, I did not occur to me. Might have been in the back of my mind, but the ramifications for my children, for the destruction that unfolded was not on my radar. And I truly believe that. I've heard it every single week in the counselling room and these people aren't lying. It's truly what they experience. It's extraordinary, isn't it? It's extraordinary that people say, I didn't wake up to make a decision to destroy my marriage. No. Um, But through one thing, one decision led to another decision. But I also think it might be appropriate just to mention that if you're dealing with this and you're the the victim, for want for a better word, that you're seeing a very destructive habit that's actually – impacting the individual, but also it's affecting you and your family. We at Focus sometimes uh, encourage couples to separate, to have what they call a healing separation. And it may be the catalyst for the other person to actually say, you need help. I've tried, I've tried everything I can, but unless you want to get help, it's not safe for the children, it's not safe for me, and it's not safe for you to continue doing this. And that can be the the wake-up call, the aha moment that we often refer to that they really do need to get help because they're actually not just saying this is bad for you, but they're saying, what are you going to lose? You're potentially losing your family. And that may be the, I've never thought of that that before. Mm. And the first thing I ask is, are you sleeping? How's your health? So even the injured partner, I ask the betrayer, if it's an infidelity topic, I'll I'll say, what's happening with your health? Oh, well, no, I'm not sleeping. And uh, I, I'm catching colds there. Immu- my immune system is compromised. It affects every part of us. And so yeah. particularly if you're shocked, you've had something unveiled and you're the injured partner, it is so common that your health physically will be compromised. And it's not sort of to make things catastrophic. Um, some people can function very well, but it's worth just considering how our bodies can be affected by yeah. the, the emotional stress. The yeah, the, the body, body does the keep score. score. Yes. Our guest today is Joanne Wilson with my wife, Kate, and I'm Brett Ryan for Focus on the Family, Australia. The word for today is Australia's most widely read daily devotional, designed to give you practical teaching to keep you focused on your relationship with Jesus. Read it online or subscribe to the free printed edition at thewordfortoday.com.au. Well, welcome back. Our guest today is counsellor and neuropsychotherapist Joanne Wilson. And we're talking about common relationship mistakes. And you're listening to Focus on the Family, Australia. We talked about in the pre-discussion about family of origin. We've spoken about uh, the challenges that addictions can have on our relationships. We've also spoken about jealousy. Um, but one of the things that I think I'd like to talk about in more detail is the most common denominator in conflict is that you're there. (laughs) You're the common denominator in conflict. So many people would say, you know, it's their fault. It's, it's the other person's fault. 
And uh, we often refer to have a look in the mirror and what are you contributing to this conflict? What are you contributing to the demise of this relationship? And so why don't we start there? You are the common denominator in conflict. Yes, I think we need to all have a little bit of self-reflection. So look at your self-defensiveness. Does that dominate and disable your ability to hear something you might not necessarily like about yourself? You mentioned the word mirror and uh, a partnership or marriage can be an unwanted mirror to your soul or someone reflecting back some behaviours that might not be particularly favourable to other people Mm. and you don't want to hear about that, do you? Well, I certainly don't want to be criticised about how I stack the dishwasher, for example, or all sorts of things that I We could talk about that, couldn't we? (laughs) (laughs) No. Try me, Kate. Go on, support me here. (laughs) Oh, oh, well, it's probably me. (laughs) But my, mine's not about that. It's about driving. They don't have to be deal breakers, oh. though. And uh, no. I think that's the important thing. There's some things that are, you know, are really important. Some of the just little things that can annoy us, but not enough but to actually- trigger us about the bigger things. Yeah, they trigger us about the bigger things. So let's unpack that. You're saying that many people may not necessarily like to hear it, but they do need to hear it. Yeah. And if you don't like hearing feedback, I think it is just worth considering your self-worth. How are you viewing yourself? If you're already full of self-loathing, it's pretty hard for you to take some feedback from someone else because you don't already like yourself. You're already expecting someone else and that's just triggering in itself. So you're very, very, uh, I guess your radar is up high yeah. um, for feedback that isn't particularly good. So it's not going to land well. But uh, I say that my greatest goal in the counseling room is to support couples in delivering feedback in a non-blaming way and for their partner to receive it in that way. So assuming we've done all this self-reflection, we've decided that we are feeling good enough to be able to approach conflict in a very helpful way that I would suggest that you scaffold it again is to make sure that you let your partner know if this has been a a tricky topic or that you're not so good with conflict is give them the heads up in the theme of, can I just let you know something? I'm struggling with something because then they know that this is their cue not to defend themselves, not to Mm -hmm. jump in and tell you why you're wrong. It's about, could you please just listen to me for just a moment? And you're delivering it with your feeling words first, not just you always, you never, your mm. you, 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 uh, I think you would even apply this in any organisation. So in the workplace, uh, it's appropriate communication to try and deliver. I feel whatever when this happens and come up with a solution is, I guess, the three-step process that we usually recommend when, when delivering deliver. feedback to your partner. And the second step there is to make sure that if you are the recipient of some feedback that isn't particularly helpful is to ask a question because there are so many different conflict dances that we see in the counseling room, defensiveness, withdrawal, uh, attack, defend. Basically, we play table tennis with conflict, Mm. just back and forth, attack and defend, and no one wins. So it's a bit of a process. It can take a number of sessions, but if I were to summarize it, it would be if you hear something that is hard to hear, take a breath and ask more questions. Not just one, but with genuine inquiry. Give your partner the gift of being able to feel heard and validated. And then you can find out what it's really about before getting triggered about something that it's not about. Yeah. Mm. That's so good. Obviously, this is something I work with a lot. I've got a lot to say on this topic. Oh, very very much so. And we're giving giving (laughs) the abridged version. But I think what people are are understanding, it it takes work. It does take work. And and we talk about seeking to understand and also thinking of your spouse as not doing things intentionally to harm you. So showing grace to one another that they are going to make mistakes. But if you're willing to adjust and make those, even the little one percent is going to make all the difference in your relationship. But it's making that a priority. So that leads us to the next one about making your relationship a priority. You know, life can get really busy and full. Um, Kids, life, looking after older parents maybe as you're getting older. And Kate mentioned Mm. uh, in a previous conversation that we've had, you know, like seeing older people that we call the gray hair divorce that is happening, unfortunately, that they didn't invest in the relationship in the formative years. So when they get older. So how do we make our relationship a priority? Yeah, it's that 
beautiful intention again. Uh, sometimes we just need to make sure that we have scheduled this in advance because, you know, even with some couples, we schedule sex. Like if couples are really, really busy and hectic and one of them has a lower libido, we just need to make sure that we schedule Wednesday night in. And it sounds really not spontaneous at all, but it's a good start. So mm. when you have your partner at the bottom of your list, it's almost worth thinking, why are you working instead more than spending time with your partner? Yes, we all need to work, but do you need to make sure that where are your priorities? Like if the whole house falls down your safe house from spending your time elsewhere, what's the kind of the point? Do you know what I mean? Like it's mm. we're working to provide for our families, but if we're not spending any time with them, you kind of lose that anyway, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's about making sure that your priorities are together. Now, if you're thinking about sort of more the aging population, it's a bit like investing in your body now for your future years and have you invested that time. And so, again, if you haven't invested that and you are sort of going into retirement mode, it's worth just having a look at the, all the elements of your relationship, such as are you conflicting well? Some couples have been bickering their whole relationship okay. and that's not a nice way no. to be traveling around in a caravan or whatever it is that you're <laughs> yes, doing. Yes, that's right. You get into a small box and all of a sudden you go, oh, it'll be a wonderful trip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But still you've got that common denominator of yourself <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. your partner and all of your old routines. So yeah, I think just it is intentional is all I can think about is just working out what are your priorities and finding out if your partner isn't one, then why? There's got to be a reason. Yeah, very much so. You mentioned it before that in your rooms, you're seeing people coming in for infidelity that they didn't know what their boundaries were and they've broken mm. the boundaries. They've broken the boundary of trust and it takes time. And, and we have seen the most dysfunctional relationships being restored if they're realizing that what they've done to hurt the other person mm. and they can be healed. It, it is possible. Yes. But what can we do about uh, preventing these from ever occurring? The boundaries being breached yeah. and, and allowing things to distract us. Yeah, I think it's just worth making sure that all those elements of what makes a safe and happy relationship are the priority, which is daily rituals, attending to each other's love languages, making sure that our needs are met and that of your partners and having those regular interactions. We've discussed communication and that's mm. why it's really important because our needs can change over time. We lose our jobs, we get bigger jobs, we have children and all those stages in our life cycle. And it's just worth making sure that we are working together as a couple. But to, I guess, infidelity proof your relationship, it's just being mindful of, you know, often we have like a mission statement with some couples uh, in different styles of therapy. It's called different things, but it's about making an absolute explicit statement that we will protect each other's backs in public and in private. Mm. You know, you can get quite specific. When we were out without the other person, we will check in after 10 p.m. <clears throat> we will always make sure that we regulate each other's alcohol intake and we will take on feedback about that. We will never have this in the house or that in the house. So again, it's almost like a contract that you have that couples mm. don't bother to do. And I highly recommend it. And it can be a beautiful thing as well. Like we stand for altruism and we will commit to donating a certain amount of our income. It can also be that we plan to contribute uh, in overseas missions. So it's a bit like goal setting, but it's also a beautiful contract and an intention that a couple can have that can be a beautiful element of keeping those boundaries safe and secure. It doesn't yeah. mean that we still can't be tempted. It doesn't mean that this is, you know, set and secure and you don't change some of those elements in your marriage mission statement. Yeah. But it definitely helps. Yeah. I, I love the concept of sitting down together and thinking through those things because it's planning together. And I think that is part of the big issue mm. is over time, you, you talked about this earlier, you know, whether it's aging parents, whether it's young kids, whether it's, we change. I, I love mean, that term, treat your partner with wonder and inquiry. And how do you do that yes. every day? Make it an intention to go, wow, let's look at our partner and be grateful. 
and let's look at them and see how can I be a better wife or partner today. Sometimes uh, at different junctures in uh, marriage therapy, I say, right, for this week, I would love for you to turn to your partner at some stage each day and say one thing you're grateful for and one ask them a question, how can I be a better partner for you today? And the other person just can't say, I don't know. But I must reiterate, though, that for those couples or individuals that have come from a legacy of infidelity, this is where I think it can be a real slippery slope and Mm. it can get passed down generations. I'd have to say more often than not, if I'm working with this in the counselling room, uh, if there's a betrayer, it's more often than not in their family. And so Mm -hmm. even though it's just so bizarre, like, they were young and they didn't know it was happening. They didn't find out about it until afterwards. It was a grandpa or whatever, but it can manifest as an acceptable behaviour, even when you don't like it. The same as addictions. Like we come yeah. from our alcoholic parents. We do have that propensity to repeat that behaviour. So that's where more often than not that give yourself that mm. gift of preparing to keep your relationship safe and secure if that has been part of your family history. Yeah, well, that's good. We've run out of time, unfortunately, but, you know, we often refer to, you know, you're leaning into each other during these, the, mm. the tensions and the highs and the lows, but ultimately leaning into God. Because as we mm. lean into his love, we can actually fall more in love with our spouse as we mm. fall more in love with Jesus. And there's nothing you can't do that he won't forgive you for. So that's just yeah. a reminder that you can be forgiven. So it's just yeah. about bringing it out into the light. Grace upon grace. Well, mm. thanks again for being our guest today, Joanne. My pleasure. If you'd like to find out more about Joanne Wilson, you can go to our website at relationshiprejuvenator.com. And if you're listening to this and something has triggered something regarding your relationship, then you really need someone to talk to or the benefit of being able to pray for you, you can go to our website at families.org.au. And our free pastoral care service and all the resources that you have on our website and on our video channels will all be made available because of the generosity of our faithful partners. We are so grateful for those that give and pray for us. Please consider partnering with us so we can help more Australian families thrive in Christ. And we appreciate you tuning in once again today. On behalf of Kate and the rest of the team, I'm Brett Ryan, inviting you to join us again for another edition of Focus on the Family, Australia. for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.